This film is a project of the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Citizenship is every person's highest calling. Let me ask you something. Anthony Kennedy is an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. When you see those law books on the wall of an attorney's office or a judge's office, what's in those books? Stories. Real stories of real people. The world's greatest fiction writer couldn't invent some of these wonderful stories. Yik Wo goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. Who is Yik Wo? He's not even a citizen of the United States. Yik Wo went all the way to the Supreme Court to try to save his laundry business, and along the way, he ended up establishing a fundamental constitutional right for all of us. But before we get to Yik Wo, there are a couple of things we need to know. The first Chinese who came to America in any large numbers came during the gold rush. Gold was discovered in uh, 1849, and uh, many people from all over the world came to, to California to uh, make their fortunes in the gold fields. That's when you had large numbers of Chinese coming. They came to work. They came to make money. Their hard work was noticed by the companies building the Transcontinental Railroad. They brought workers from China to do manual work and, literally, to move mountains. The Chinese laborers were the only ones they could get to do it. The railroad sent their agents to China to recruit workers. It was very dangerous work. The Chinese would be working by being suspended on a rope. They'd put a charge of TNT, dynamite, in the mountain. And they'd say, now's the time, and they had to quickly pull them up before the dynamite went off. The completion of the Transcontinental Railroad is one of the greatest achievements of the 19th century. And when it was done, many of those same laborers went to San Francisco. To this day, it's still home to the nation's largest Chinatown. San Francisco's Chinatown was called the number one city because for Chinese, that was the main city that they arrived through on their way to any other place in California. And San Francisco was headquarters to the family and district associations that comprise the social organization for Chinese. So when one arrived by ship in San Francisco, one would go to the Chinese quarter, one would seek out one's family or district association, get a hot meal, a place to stay overnight, and it was also a place where one could send and receive mail, send money home, and also, in the event of death, it would be the organization that would send your bones back to your family. They then wanted to stay, the Chinese in California, and were not too welcome because they were competing with other residents of California who wanted also to earn a livelihood. The Chinese immigrants were 10% of the total population in California by 1880, but they were outsiders whose rights had to be protected by powers that were very far away. There were treaties between the United States and China. This provides for equal treatment. Under the United States system, all local entities are bound by a U.S. treaty. That's in theory. Remember, the law has to be sound in theory and fair in practice. And the difference between theory and practice can be very significant. Now, here's something most Americans today would have a hard time with. Until World War II, Chinese immigrants to America could not become citizens. We wouldn't let them. The Naturalization Act of 1790 only allowed white persons to naturalize. Then the language became more direct. The United States Congress passed the Exclusion Acts in the 1880s, suspending immigration from China and going one step further. The law actually prohibited Chinese immigrants from becoming U.S. citizens. Citizen of the United States means that you can vote. Uh, you can have political power to protect your interests uh, in local government. The Chinese did not have that advantage. You have to realize that in public discussion in California, Dislike of the Chinese was expressed extremely openly. They wanted the Chinese immigrants to leave. 
Neither the state or the city has any power over immigration. That all belongs to the national government. So they couldn't ban Chinese immigrants, they could just make their lives miserable. San Francisco was a hotbed of anti-immigrant sentiment. And so San Francisco passed a number of local ordinance. For example, San Francisco passed an ordinance that anyone disembarking from a ship that landed in San Francisco Harbor had to pay an extra tax for every passenger that was Chinese. They also had an ordinance against lewd women and other kinds of undesirable people coming by steamer. Europeans came overland, <laughs> Mexicans came overland as well. The only people who regularly came by steamer were the Chinese. Every dwelling had to have 500 cubic feet of air per occupant. Designed to target the Chinese who lived in very close quarters where the density was very high. This would be another way to make it impossible for them to stay in the same apartment, in the same house. Since uh, the, the penalty for violating the law was either a fine or time in the county jail, and most Chinese, when convicted for violating the law, would choose time in the county jail. And this irritated the uh, San Francisco uh, Board of Supervisors, and so they passed a law. Anyone who was convicted of a crime and was in jail would have to have their head shaved um, to within an inch. This was so obnoxious that even the mayor vetoed it. Wearing one's hair uh, for males in a queue or a, a tail was a required practice under the Manchu dynasty. It was a sign of respect to the emperor. So to have one's hair shorn would mean not only humiliation, but would mean that one couldn't go back to China without being arrested. All of these laws on their face seem to be neutral, race neutral, right? The steamer statute doesn't say just the Chinese, but it's obvious it's about the Chinese because they were the only ones who came in large numbers via steamer. Prisoners had to have haircuts, and this was really directed at the Chinese, which everybody knew. They knew that you knew that they knew this, uh, and yet the law looked fair on its face, and that's really the beginning for an understanding of, of, of Yikuo. We really don't know that much about Yikuo. He didn't leave any pictures of himself, and there's not much beyond court records. We're not even really sure that was his name. But it was the name of the laundry service he had run for 22 years. Yikuo was, in every way, an exemplary businessman. One of the occupations that the Chinese tended to specialize in were laundries. They dominated the uh, California laundry industry from the very beginning. Attacking the Chinese laundries was one part of a larger strategy of harassing Chinese in San Francisco. And because so many Chinese were employed in the laundry occupation, this was a particularly effective kind of uh, target. The ordinance language simply says that anyone who operates a laundry that is not made of brick or stone must obtain a special certificate of operation from the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Yikuo's building? You guessed it, wood. In fact, every Chinese laundry in the city, every single one, was in a wooden building. At this time in San Francisco, the vast majority of structures were made of wood. Uh, stone buildings would have been the exception. Even as to wooden laundries, as the story turns out, the ordinance was not fair in the way it was administered. It was not fair in practice. Why? The record in this case shows that there were 280 permit applications for wooden laundries. 80 were granted, 200 denied. The 80 were all granted to Caucasians. The 200 were all denied to the Chinese. All the Chinese who applied were, for permits were turned down. Not one Chinese laundry was granted a license. None. Zero. Goose egg. Ling. It's a 21st century metaphor to say this is not rocket science uh, to figure out that something was wrong. Something is drastically wrong. 
The Board of Supervisors ordered Yikuo to shut down without ever explaining why. Even though he had already obtained a safety certificate from the fire warden, and he had also passed an inspection by the city's health department. Yikuo refused to close, so he went to jail, where he would fight his case from behind bars. The Chinese had a well-developed legal consciousness. They know that the, the, they were not totally without protection, even though they were very, very vulnerable. Um, they knew that they could go to court. It took tremendous courage and a willingness to put your neck on the line if you're Yik Wo to file this lawsuit. But I actually think that the attorneys that brought these lawsuits deserve a certain amount of recognition as well because they were going against the popular grain. With the help of one of the most powerful associations in Chinatown, the Chinese Laundrymen's Guild, or in Chinese, the Tong Hing Tong, Yik Wo hired Hal McAllister, widely considered the best lawyer in all the West. There's actually a statue dedicated to him outside of San Francisco's City Hall today. In all, 150 laundry owners got themselves arrested for resisting the ordinance. Two cases went through the courts. Yik Wo took his case all the way to the California Supreme Court, where he lost. Another owner, Wo Li, took his case to the Federal Ninth Circuit Court, where it was heard by Judge Lorenzo Sawyer. Judge Sawyer realized early on that state and local government in California was using the police power as a cloak in order to mask legislation that they were passing that specifically targeted the Chinese. Police power is a concept that goes about four centuries back to England and the development of towns and cities. And it's the idea that there are some rules and behaviors that are best regulated and enforced by local government. Public safety and order, health issues. Even something like making sure that butchers and bakers have scales that actually weigh a pound when they say they weigh a pound, that would have all been under the local police power. But the Civil War changed that a little as many states and cities had laws that were at odds with the federal constitution, slavery being the most obvious. The 14th Amendment was virtually brand new, ratified just three years after the end of the war, and it guaranteed that everyone throughout the country would be protected by the same fundamental rights equally. And Judge Sawyer cited it in his opinion. The city was using police power as an excuse that the laundry ordinance was so vague it allowed the city to discriminate because it never had to explain how it decided who got a license and who didn't. Sawyer was disgusted. He says, everyone knows what is going on here. We all know this is discrimination against the Chinese. I'm not going to pretend I don't know it just because I'm a judge sitting on the bench. Judge Sawyer was no slouch. He had served on California's very first state Supreme Court, and he knew that Yik Wo had already lost there. So he deferred to that court and decided against Wo Li, knowing that both cases, being virtually identical, would get bundled as one case and go on to the Supreme Court of the United States. And that case was Yik Wo versus Hopkins. Yik Wo goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. Yik Wo says that this ordinance uh, around the laundries and the way in which they are administered uh, violated his uh, rights under the 14th Amendment. They violated his rights to a uh, due process um, and to equal protection. The 14th Amendment was one of three amendments added to the Constitution after the Civil War to ensure that former slaves were given full citizenship and the equal protection of the law anywhere in the country. Of course, it didn't say former slave, it said person. So even though Yik Wo wasn't a former slave or a citizen, he figured that the 14th Amendment applied to him too. San Francisco argued that in the end, none of that mattered. The city says that they're not discriminating, that the language of the law is neutral, does not single out any class of people, um, and if the Chinese are found wanting in any way, it is because the way in which they run their laundries is wanting. But the justices weren't buying it. Justice Stanley Matthews wrote the opinion for a unanimous court, saying that the local ordinance was a violation of the 14th Amendment's guarantee to any person the equal protection of the law. In its very first decision based on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Supreme Court chose to protect the rights of a Chinese immigrant who was not 
an American citizen. But he's a person. And the Supreme Court of the United States read the 14th Amendment, and you can read the 14th Amendment. No person uh, shall be denied equal protection of the law. Not no citizen, no person. Yikwo is one of the very first cases to construe the 14th Amendment, to say what it was that the 14th Amendment meant. Yikwo means that uh, an immigrant uh, has the same protections um, under the 14th Amendment as citizens. It's also the first case to say that a law that is neutral on its face, as this one was, could be applied in such a discriminatory fashion uh, that it would uh, amount to what the court called a practical denial of equal protection. Justice Matthews insisted that legitimate police power had to regulate safety and health practices more clearly, and it had to be applied in good faith. San Francisco's laundry ordinance was too arbitrary. Arbitrary is one of the really important words in constitutional law. Arbitrary means no reason. The law is based on reasons. The law is based on standards that are open, that are transparent, that are fair. The law says you're entitled to this permit. But you're right. You have a right to that permit. This is not understood in many parts of the world. Not long ago, I was interested in knowing how long it takes to get a license, a permit, to have a bakery in Egypt. There's a problem with licenses there. If you want to open a bakery in Cairo, it takes you 530 days to get the permit, and you have to go almost every day to see how the permit process is going. So what do you do if you want to do a bakery? You, number one, open it without any permit at all. You're living outside the law. Number two, you bribe the official. You're living outside the law. In Brazil, the beach near Ipanema is a great place for surfing. They need surfboard shops, and it's a good business. To get a license is close to six months in Brazil. Completely unnecessary. This is the legal system being used to choke the people. A law is supposed to work on behalf of those who abide by it. People shouldn't have to go around it, and it should treat everyone equally. If the law is applied in an arbitrary way, it can be used to discriminate against a person, a group, or even an entire race. Then the fact that it's the most beautifully written law that you can possibly devise on its face means nothing. Because the law operates in the real world. And the holding of Yik Wo was that a law that it's administered with an evil eye or an unequal hand violates your right to equal protection. So it's fitting that we end where we started, back at those law books. Since Yikwo versus Hopkins was decided in 1886, it has been cited in more than 160 opinions in the Supreme Court alone. It was used time and again to strike down laws judged to be unfair on everything from education to loitering, voter apportionment to jury selection, laws that seemed to be neutral but were actually in violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. All of those stories might not have been possible without the story of Yik Wo. The principle of Yik Wo has never been questioned. Has never been questioned. He wasn't even a citizen of the United States, and he brings the case to establish a fundamental constitutional principle. The Supreme Court of the United States said, we, and our justice, protect you. This is a gift that Yik Wo gave to us, and it's a gift that we gave to him.